Okay, we have here today a really interesting integral from the MIT integration B from 2015, number 16. We have the integral from zero to two pi of one over sine of the fourth x plus cosine of the fourth x dx. Okay, really interesting integral here today. The thing that I thought was interesting, you know, it's just having even powers on here and it looks almost like King's principle. If you notice, like maybe one of the most common examples of King's principle is if we had sine or cosine of the same power here in the numerator, and if this upper bound was pi over two, this would be kind of our ideal case for King's principle. We don't have that, we don't have that in the numerator. So what I wanted to do actually was look at the more general example of this. Like we could just say, if our integral is going from zero to B, and then instead of saying necessarily we have four, let's just say we have sine to the nx plus cosine to the nx. And in this integral, we want n to be even, but I think we also want n to be greater than two because if n's two, this is, the whole thing's just one and it's kind of a silly example. And then let's just look at our definition for King's principle. Okay, now we have our definition over here to the right, and I've shown this in previous videos. You can go from here to here just by doing a u substitution to get it in this form. Now in our case, if we're gonna to try to use this, we're looking at a more specific case because we already know our a is zero. So I can just kind of change this if a is zero, then we can just kind of update it everywhere. So then over here, this is gonna be zero, but then this right here is gonna go away. And the reason I'm doing this is because what I wanna look at is we just have this simple expression over here, f of b minus x. Like coming back to our integral, this would be like f of two pi minus x. So what I was thinking is with the even exponents on our original problem in here, let's just see what's gonna happen when we have f of b minus x. So first I'll just look at the specific example from our problem when b is gonna be two pi, and we're gonna to wanna to calculate our f of b minus x. So in this case, it's gonna be, we wanna calculate f of two pi minus x. And in order to do that, we just need to figure out first what's gonna happen for sine of two pi minus x. And we also wanna value for cosine of two pi minus x. And now these values are pretty easy because if you shift cosine or sine, you just get back the function again. So this one's gonna be cosine of x, because it doesn't matter that we change the order here on an even function. Here, this would be sine x, but we change the order, so it's like if we had a minus up front. So with this being an odd function, this is gonna be minus sine of x. And then let's just stay with our general example, but we have a power of, we have a power of n on here. So we have a power of n on here, even power. But because n is even, that's just gonna wipe out that minus sign. This is just gonna be kind of, this is just gonna become sine of the nx, and this is gonna become cosine of the nx. So putting this all together, if we call this, this is gonna be our, we're calling this our f of x. So with what we found here, if we plug that back in, f of two pi minus x, this is just gonna be the same thing. This is just gonna be f of x as well. So next we'll do something really similar, but we want a different b value here. So in this case, what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna look at some common values. We're just gonna look at when b equals pi here. So what I wanna find is we wanna find out what happens for f of pi minus x. Well, this is gonna work really similar with sine, just looking at sine of pi minus x, this is gonna be the complementary angle formula. This is the same thing as just sine of x. And then for cosine pi minus x, this is the complementary angle formula for cosine. This gives minus cosine x. But again, when we raise this to the nth power and n is even, and we do it here, well, the exact same thing happens. This minus sine gets wiped out. This becomes sine to the nx. This becomes cosine to the nx. We plug this back in here and we get that f of pi minus x is the same thing as f of x. Okay, now we'll do just one more value. We're looking at b equal to pi over two. So we wanna find f of pi over two minus x doing the same kind of business. When we look at sine pi over two minus x, that's just gonna be the complementary angle formula. So this is gonna be cosine x. And then doing the same thing over here for cosine, complementary angle formula for cosine, this is actually gonna be sine. But then let's just raise this to the nth power, but then we raise this to the n and we'll raise this to the n, we raise this to the n. We put it back in the problem. Now we have cosine to the nx plus sine nx. It's in a different order, but that's the exact same thing. So again, here for our f of pi over two minus x, this is just gonna be f of x. So now, of course, I'm not saying this is working for every b value. I've just checked three b values. But the really useful thing here is we get three common values here where we plug this in and we get back our f of x. So what we're really looking at here is we're looking at an example of the King's principle. We have a bunch of values where what's gonna happen is this is just gonna transform into the same integral. And so this here, when you're doing King's principle, this is a pretty disappointing scenario because we did a whole bunch of work and we got nowhere. So if we actually did this on our integral when b equals two pi, we just get back the same integral. And this is kind of pointless because we did all this work and we got nowhere, we just got back 
our same problem. But the good news is when we encounter this case with the King's Principle, we've got another option. So in this case of King's Principle, what we want to do is use this other principle that I derived in a previous video, where if f of 2a minus x equals f of x, we can use this, which doesn't change the value inside the integral, but it just what it does is it updates the bounds. We split this bound from 2a to a, we cut it in half, and we just brought a 2 out front. But now one thing about this, I don't want to confuse this naming convention because here our upper bound is 2a, and in our integral the upper bound is b. So let's just update everything just so we're all we're using the same variable and everything. So here we'll change this 2a to a b. We'll do the same thing right here. And then this a over here, I can rewrite this too. I can just rewrite this as b over 2, just saying we're cutting the upper bound in half. But now clearly we can use this principle because this right here, f of b minus x equals f of x, that's what we found in these three different cases. But moreover, for our starting integral, our b value is 2 pi, so it works for 2 pi. But then what's going to happen, it cuts the bound in half, but cutting 2 pi in half gets us to pi. And then doing it again gets us to pi over 2. So what this is going to do here, this is going to give us a way to reduce the balance on this integral. Okay, so now finally we can get back to our integral. So we're just looking at this here, and what we want to do, what I want to do is define, this is our, this will be our f of x value right here that we're going to deal with, and I preserved everything we found on the previous board. And what we want to do is we just want to use this principle repeatedly. So first, starting off, we have our value, our b value 2 pi. And so with 2 pi as our b value, we want to check f of b minus x. That's our first entry right here, f of 2 pi minus x. We found this is f of x. So that's going to allow us to use this principle here cut the bounds in half, so now we're going from zero to pi, and then the integral just still remains f of x. But now we just repeat the same thing with the second finding, now the upper bound is pi, so our b minus x is f of pi minus x, and that again is f of x. So it allows us to do this trick again, we cut the bounds in half, we're going from zero to two, from zero to pi over two, but we need to bring another two up front, two times two gives four, and we still have f of x as our integral. And so we'll do the same exact thing one more time. We'll bring a two out front of the integral. Two times four gives me eight. Cut the bounds in half. We're going from zero to pi over four. And then we still have f of x, our whole integral. But now at this point, you might want to keep going and try to do the same thing with pi over four. But notice I didn't do that value because it doesn't work. So we can't keep going like this. And it wouldn't really, I don't know what that would do for us if we got to like pi over 16. So now it's at the point where we actually have to just go ahead and deal with this integral. Okay, now at this point, you might be wondering why we went to all this trouble to get this, just to get an 8 out front, just to change our bounds. Well, we'll get to that in a minute, but what I want to deal with first is, I just want to deal with reducing this. What I can do for this is look at the power reduction for sine and cosine. We have these, we have these two identities. For sine squared x, we can rewrite this as 1 half, 1 minus cosine 2x. And then for cosine squared x, I can rewrite that as 1 half, one plus cosine 2x. But we don't really want to deal with sine squared and cosine squared. We want to deal with sine to the fourth and cosine to the fourth. So let's just square everything. I'll square it here, square it here. I'll square one half, square it here, right? Now when I do this, let's just multiply it out. So the one half is going to become a one fourth. Just distributing everything out, this is going to become one minus two cosine 2x plus cosine squared 2x. And then same kind of thing right here. We got one fourth, one. This becomes plus two cosine two x, and this is going to become plus cosine squared two x. And what I want to do is get this whole denominator. So when I add these together, the middle terms, because we got minus and plus, these are going to cancel, and we end up with just one half plus one half cosine squared two x. But now what we can do is let's just take this value, plug it back into the integral, and see what we can do with this. But now from here, I want to manipulate this a little bit. So noticing that I have cosine squared here, I think I want to clean that up. So what I can do with this is this trick where we multiply in, we just multiply by one, but we'll multiply by secant squared x over secant squared x. But while I do this, I think what I want to do is clean up these one halves. I'm just more comfortable with like whole numbers. So let's just multiply, we'll add a two on there. So we're still multiplying by one. That's going to fix up this piece. And then we'll just multiply everything in here. So we'll still have our eight out front here. And then, let's see, in the denominator, it's just going to be 2 secant squared x dx. 2 secant squared x times a half is just going to be 1 secant squared x. And then plus, here, everything's going to cancel. 2 secant squared, 2 is going to cancel with a half. Secant squared cancels with cosine squared x. And this is just a 1. Sorry, error correction. Everything here is 2x, not x. So I just need to update all these values with 2x. 
But next what I can do is let's just use a trig identity on this. So for secant squared, I can write this as tan squared 2x plus 1. And let's just rewrite to see what we have. In the denominator here, we're going to have this. We're going to update this to tan squared 2x, but then we're going to add the 1s. 1 plus 1 gives me a 2 here. But then now that we've got tan and secant squared in the same expression, I can just do a u substitution on this. So what I want to do is I want to set my u equal to tan 2x, and then our du, this is going to give me secant squared 2x, but I can't forget this 2, so we bring the 2 out front, dx. And so we'll just go ahead with this substitution. We've got our 8 out front. We plug pi over 4 in here. 2 times pi over 4 is pi over 2. Tan at pi over 2 from the negative side is going to infinity. And then we plug 0 in here. Tan at 0 is just 0. But an important note right here, we plugged in pi over 4 here. Now, if we just did this problem originally, we're plugging in 2 pi here. We plug 2 pi here at tan at 4 pi. This becomes 0. We're going from 0 to 0, and then our whole integral is 0 but that's actually the wrong answer. So that's one reason I did all that work to reduce the bounds. The other way to look at it, of course, is tan is not continuous on the region from zero to two pi. So we had to break this up. There is a totally different way to do this. The other way is what you could do is you could actually break up this integral into, I don't know, it's like five integrals. If you break it up on all the discontinuities and you integrate it that way, you actually end up with like eight pieces. So it works out the same way. Personally, I prefer to break it up with the identity we showed at the beginning of the video, but if you're more comfortable, you could just break it up on the discontinuities, same exact thing. So then going ahead, updating all this stuff, this is just our du here in the numerator. The denominator becomes just u squared plus two. I'm gonna write that as square root of two squared. This is what I'm setting up is for this integral, it's just gonna be arctan. So we'll use our arctan formula really quick. This is gonna give me, I'll write it as one over square root of two arctan of just u over square root of two. And we need to evaluate this from zero to infinity. We'll bring our eight over square root of two out front for now. Arctan for infinity, that's just gonna be pi over two. And then evaluating, we plug in zero, arctan at zero, that's just gonna be zero. I can cancel two with eight here, and this is gonna give me a four. This goes away. We're gonna have four over square root of two pi. I think I'll just rationalize this. So what I can do is multiply by square root of two over two. Square root of two times square root of two here, this gives me a two. If I cancel two with four, we just get here a two. So for my final solution of this, we end up with just two square root of two pi. Okay, so there you have it. Kind of a long problem and quite a bit of work. So that's it for today. Thanks everyone for watching. Have a good day.